Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining uh, this month's uh, SIG OpenXLA community meeting. Um, we have a good agenda together uh, for you today. Um, just to restate, as we do every meeting, um, the mission of OpenXLA is to build an open state-of-the-art um, compiler ecosystem um, collaboratively with hardware and software partners using the best of um, XLA and um, MLAR ecosystem. Um, so first off, um, we always like to invite new attendees to this meeting to introduce themselves um, if they haven't had the opportunity to do so before. So do we have anybody new um, joining us today? All right, um, no worries. If not, feel free to also introduce yourself in the chat um, if you feel more comfortable with that. So I'm gonna keep things moving along here pretty quickly um, since we start late. Um, here is an overview for those of you who are new um, on the different channels um, that we use to uh, kind of engage with the community. Um, in OpenXLA, we have a monthly uh, Zoom meeting that's normally on the third Wednesday, Tuesday, um, except this week, uh, rotating meeting host and scribe. Um, and when possible, we share our agenda um, the week prior on GitHub discussions. Um, after today, uh, we will add the meeting minutes and slides publicly in the meeting archive in the community repo. Um, and generally, these meetings include development updates, design proposals, and community topics. Here's an overview of our collaboration channels. Um, all of these are also available on the um, slash community repo in the OpenXLA GitHub org. So please feel free um, to look for all of this there or in the meeting slides that we'll share later. OK, so moving on to some development updates we have. Um, from members of the OpenXLA team and a few others. Um, first off, we have Ilya Sergachev um, talking about cost analysis based fusion in XLA GPUs. Ilya, do you want to take over? Sure. Um, will you keep the slides or shall we? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we'll do um, next. We'll just say next slide. Okay, perfect. Sure. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present. I will um, um, briefly uh, tell about my progress on improving the fusion logic in XLA GPU in the past few months. Um, I'll tell a bit uh, about the motivation of this work and the technical details of the cost analysis of uh, HLO graphs and how we model the performance of uh, GPU uh, executing those. Um, and we will see um, the results that we get with this uh, modeling. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So when we program for GPUs, uh, our general mood is to optimize for the DRAM access uh, because it is typically the bottleneck if you don't uh, do any specific optimization uh, for that. And the ratio is roughly one to 100 uh, of compute performance and DRAM access. And uh, in addition, we have lots of threads, which ideally should do the same work and not communicate between each other. That's the most efficient way basically to use the GPU, very simplified. And this leads us to um, the approaches that we take uh, during code generation and compilation for GPUs, and that's to split problems into independent parallel uh, pieces and to our main approach to trade off um, computation for uh, memory bandwidths is fusion. And um, uh, basically, we, uh, yeah, basically we uh, repeat computations in different threads um, to save on communication between them. Next slide, please. Yep, so um, brief overview of the compilation process. We have as an input of our compiler, the HLO graph, which is uh, uh, every node in the, of this graph uh, is a fairly simple operation, uh, which has certain input shapes and output shapes. And we do optimizations on this graph. 
and uh, with the fusion that's the main focus of uh, the today's talk and then we generate the code for the, each of these fusions and then we uh, do additional work uh, buffer assignment scheduling and then we execute all this next slide please so overall logic of fusion is to look at the nodes of the graph and see which ones are profitable to merge together into a single gpu kernel uh, that way we save uh, on uh, writing the intermediate results of uh, produced by these nodes uh, into uh, DRAM and instead we just directly pass the result of one uh, node into the next one. And often we do that by uh, replicating them um, and sometimes uh, it is a trade-off um, or fairly often it is a trade-off uh, between um, compute time and memory access time. And there are different patterns of uh, uh, connections within an HLO graph that we find profitable to merge. And this results in different um, uh, topologies in the end. Next slide, please. So very briefly, the part of the fusion pipeline on which we are interested in together looks like this. At first, we take unconnected or say connected but not grouped uh, instructions within an HLO graph and uh, we try to merge them uh, ba based on a very simple logic uh, basically we take uh, only very simple instructions like element wise ones or not much more complicated than that and we group them that way we already get from um, uh, just, un uh, just ungrouped instructions to small groups. Uh, and then we apply the next step, uh, which is called fusion merger. And then there is another flavor of it, which is called multi out fusion. They do a very similar thing. They look at larger groups of instructions produced in the first step, and they try to identify which groups are profitable to merge. So it's basically the same process, but at the next level. What is nice here is that the number of nodes that we have to analyze is reduced a lot by the first step. So we can apply more advanced analysis to these uh, groups produced by the first step. And the logic that we use here essentially has to tell us if it is profitable to merge uh, uh, fusions or not. And the profit for us is most often just execution time. So ideally we should be able to estimate the execution times of two cases if we merge certain fusions or if we don't. Next slide, please. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, basically, the execution time of a fusion is defined by two things. First, it's the um, attributes of the fusion itself, like the amount of compute you have to do and the amount of memory access to execute this fusion. And also, of course, the GPU performance uh, um, is the second component of, of uh, that, that we need to estimate the runtime. And we have to, of course, account for several things like input and output access times, kernel launch overhead. If we change the number of kernels that launch, then it's better because there are certain overheads. Um, we have to see if we are efficiently using the whole GPU or if Fusion is small and is only using a few cores. And uh, that tells us that we have to use um, parameters of a specific GPU ideally to model the execution time on this uh, exact GPU. Next slide, please. So how do we analyze actually uh, an HLO graph uh, for the cost at first? Um, we have to look uh, at first at each operation alone within the graph. And um, that's fairly simple. An operation has simply input shapes, output shapes, simple math in between. So for every single operation, it's fairly easy to analyze the costs. What is more complicated is to analyze uh, them in connections because not all operations are element-wise. It happens that an operation requests results of another one multiple times. Um, also, the implementation of uh, the operation can, can change its costs a lot if we want to execute an approximate uh, uh, operation or an exact one. If the data type is really simple and native for the GPU, or say it's a complex data type, which requires more uh, basic operations and things like this. And um, it's really important that certain instructions are non-element wise and um, they 
make us execute certain parts of HLO graph multiple times uh, uh, to uh, feed this operation. Next slide, please. So a very basic example showing why it is important to traverse the whole graph uh, to reason about the cost of a fusion is here. And you can see that nominally this fusion just with three nodes takes uh, 100 megabytes uh, at the input. However, if we carefully traverse the whole fusion from the root, we will see that it actually only produces one byte. And um, the code generated for this fusion will also uh, be efficient and will not request the whole 100 megabytes from the memory. So, and if we only looked at the nominal parameters like the uh, of the fusion, like the parameter size and the root size, we would say that it needs lots of access to the memory. So we actually have to traverse the whole graphs um, to, to analyze properly. Next slide, please. So here is a slightly more complicated exam example of a traversal of fusion to correctly estimate how much uh, uh, it uses every node within it and also the input parameter. If we start at the root, the root is always, uh, we can always assume it's produced 100%. That's easy. And then we have to look at uh, every node, how it uses its input parameters, where it, whether it's element-wise or not. And then we can propagate the utilization of every node and accumulate them when we reach a certain node after we looked at all of its users. So here, for example, the uh, slicing operations um, at the bottom uh, strongly change the use of the negate operation at the close to the parameter. And then we see that in the end, the parameter is used 170% instead of just 100 that the naive approach would tell us. Um, and of course, this gets much more complicated in larger fusions. So really this traversal has to be done all the time. And it's probably the most technical part of my work, uh, but um, it, it's not that complicated once you um, figure out all the details. Next slide, please. Um, another part uh, of uh, the cost analysis um, is to know the computation complexity of every HLO node within a graph. So uh, if um, you ask someone, is logarithm fast to compute? Of course it is. You won't notice the time that it takes to compute. And even if you make a few log logarithm operations in one thread, that's still fast. However, um, question is how many operations can you chain within one thread so that it uh, gets actually slow? And it doesn't have to be a chain. What I mean here is that one thread has to produce, has to compute a certain number of operations uh, during the kernel. And we have to be sure that um, we don't make one thread do too much work to uh, actually not be bound by compute in the end. Um, so to analyze that properly, I had to develop a separate simple tool which analyzes for every type of basic math operation and for every data type, um, how many operations per thread do we need to actually become compute bound by this operation. So on the plots at the bottom right, you can see that if we chain say 10 logarithms in one thread, that's still very fast for um, all the three data types presented here. However, if we chain enough complex 128 operations that quickly becomes uh, expensive and not memory bound anymore. So the left part of this graph is where all the kernels are mm, memory bound, but they start to become compute bound uh, depending on the data type and the number of operations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now having these two components, the um, amount of uh, utilization of every node and the compute times uh, or the computational intensity of the nodes, we can um, add the GPU performance numbers to try to estimate the time needed to execute a fusion. And that's defined by a few components. The easiest one is the output write time. That's always straightforward. It's just determined by the output size and DRAM bandwidth. Then the input access times are slightly 
more tricky because they can have non-unity utilization by the uh, fusion. And um, depending on the size of the input, the likelihood changes whether it will be read from caches or DRAM. Basically, the larger is the input, the more likely it will be read from DRAM. Um, and then the compute time of the fusion is um, defined by the sum of compute times of all the nodes, also modulated by the utilization. And then we have to also be careful to see that the fusion actually uses the whole GPU and not only a small part of it, uh, just being very inefficient. Then of course we have to add the kernel launch overhead, which matters for uh, very small fusions. Next slide, please. Um, and just to highlight once again that it's important to account for the effects of caching. Here we can see two fusions, right and left one, which have nominally the same amount of memory access. However, the right one has a broadcast, uh, which makes us read the same thing, which is small, but multiple times. And that happens by reading from caches, and that's actually significantly faster. And the model has to account for such things to be accurate. Next slide, please. Mm, nope. Yep. Um, no, that's the previous one. No, 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 that's going backwards. Okay, let me know when I've got it. Uh, next, next, next. Yep, awesome. uh, perfect. So we're getting to the last part and I will just show a very simple example. Um, what can we do with such a model now that we can uh, estimate the run times of fusion? So we take a fairly simple fusion that is shown uh, uh, in this vertical graph uh, on the left. It's really, really simple. It has just 384 output elements, a simple float 32. And I just zoomed in the top and bottom parts of the fusion to the right so that you can see it really has nothing special, just adds, uh, multiplies, subtracts, and things like this. Um, next slide, please. But now we'll consider um, merging this fusion into its consumer because it's such a small one, uh, what can go wrong? So we look at the consumer, which is the gray um, rectangle to the right, and I'm just showing a small part of it because it's a really large one. Uh, and what we can see a uh, few nodes away from the input parameter of the consumer corresponding to the producer is that there is a broadcast. And it's times 7,500 roughly, which is already not that great. So that means that the consumer will, if we merge these two fusions, it will uh, produce independently the uh, producer 7,500 times. And that's already questionable if the execution of this will be faster or not. Uh, next slide, please. And then if, if we go further through the graph of the consumer, we'll see that then it broadcasts this even another 16 times. And then it goes even further down the graph, we'll omit this. Uh, next slide, please. So actually, if we apply the model and um, estimate the run times, we'll see that it's better to not merge here. And it's three times as fast to execute the kernels separately, non-merged, than the merged version. And that's confirmed by profiling. And that's originally a bug that uh, one of those that motivated this work. Um, next slide, please. So overall, um, this uh, application of cost model and performance modeling to uh, fusion merging enabled larger fusions and it replaced um, a set of heuristics which were um, handpicked to decide which fusions to merge or not. Um, and this results now in faster execution of uh, a number of benchmarks and models. Uh, we also got faster compilation because uh, this model is also used uh, to estimate the code size that we produce. And it, um, as an auxiliary effect, it reduced register spilling, uh, which makes the PTX assembler suffer a lot. And we got better profiling in XProf because now we better see how much input parameters of fusions are 
actually utilized and not just looking at their nominal sizes. Uh, next slide, please. So the model still, um, of course, is not perfect. It uses a number of assumptions that are listed here. They are mostly um, quite reasonable and the model shows itself quite correct in most, ca most cases. And when it isn't, it's usually proportionally off uh, for the merged and unmerged cases, which still makes it uh, take the right decisions, uh, which is nice. However, um, I would say two most important things here are that first, uh, models should eventually be made aware of indexing uh, within the nodes and tiling so that um, it enables even better decisions. And second is that right now it relies on several facts about the code generation uh, that are hand embedded in this model. However, ideally we should have a separate code layer which would synchronize the model and the code generation which runs after the fusion so that the model exactly knows what the code will be produced for a given fusion. Um, and that's all for my presentation. Thank you. And questions, please. And also if you'll, also if you'll oh, gosh, um, put your questions in the chat. Um, and we can follow up there in case we need to move on. But I think we have time for at least one. For the, um, the the pieces where you were uh, had uh, hardware specifics taken into account for the decision making, like that, like you mentioned, like the uh, latencies of the caching and and whatnot, um, is 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 there still heuristics there or, or is this, are you querying? Cause over like hardware generations and stuff that those stuff change, right? So how, how is that? Is, is that just kind of queried from the hardware at this point? Or are we, are we just kind of have we a- query whatever, Yep, thank you for the question. We query whatever is available through the APIs, um, like the cache sizes and um, like number of cores and things like this really whatever is available. And for the rest, like say the speed up of cache versus DRAM, we have to use uh, numbers from data sheets sometimes or just sometimes from benchmarking. Um, that's how it is. Okay. Okay, thanks. So maybe there's some some more that could be done there to make that more dynamic or, or, or as we evolve. But yeah, this is cool, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, let's move on to the next presentation. Thanks so much, Ilya. Um, okay, so that's me. Um, let's see, let me turn my camera back on. Yeah. For some reason, that's not letting me go back in slides. Oh gosh, there we go, okay. Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our governance update. Um, and so basically uh, we've been doing a lot of work over the um, last you know few months, including talking uh, a lot with all of the community members and partners um, in OpenXLA about how we should think about project governance, um, both technical and non-technical. Um, and what we've done today is um, I put together a slide summarizing um, essentially a governance doc, um, initial governance model uh, doc that we'll publish um, later today as an RFC. Um, and we are looking forward to your comments on that, um, but just to kind of give a little bit of background around our thinking um, and a basic overview of, of this governance proposal, um, that's what I'll walk you through today. So um, when we sat down to draft governance, um, we had some goals in mind. Um, we really wanted to make sure that decisions can be made both efficiently and inclusively, um, that any escalations to kind of disagreements around code level changes or otherwise 
um, are used rarely, um, but have a clear path. Um, and also that the governance model supports increasing project complexity. So like adding a lot of new modules, um, adding other projects, um, and also that, you know, through that complexity, contributors can easily find um, what they need to participate. Um, also, we'd love to move towards building technical leadership that's diverse and that at its heart rewards continued investment um, and contributions to code. And um, with all of that um, collaboration happening um, constructively and respectfully, um, no matter who uh, the contributor or maintainer is. Um, so we looked at a lot of different open source governance models, um, but here are the, the primary projects that we refer to quite a bit, um, obviously LLVM, um, but also Carbon, um, Swift, and Rust, and then finally PyTorch, which came out in the last month with um, an updated governance model that, that we liked for its um, scalability and simplicity. Um, so where we landed in terms of the key principles of open XLA governance um, is that we wanted to empower small groups to make consensus-driven uh, consensus decisions um, with really clearly defined escalation paths, um, and that this structure is, is hierarchical um, and scalable, and also um, in being hierarchical, hierarchical, that it's very clear whose um, responsibilities are within what scope and that, that we minimize as much as possible any overlaps um, to avoid you know, questions of like, who actually is empowered to make this decision. Um, we wanted decision-making processes and also promotion processes transparent and, and predictable. Um, governance documents should be uh, clearly written and, and practically usable. Um, not too difficult to parse via like, you know, not too much legalese. Um, technical responsibility will track with actual code contributions um, and, and, you know, and that will, those levels of contributions we expect um, maintainers to maintain throughout their tenure. Um, and then all community members are held, uh, that should say held to common standards. So what this looks like in terms of governance structure um, is that we have um, four main roles. Um, obviously, uh, contributors file issues, make pull requests and proposals, and contribute to the project. And this can in include any contributor wishing to um, review um, and add comments to um, individual pull requests. Um, a set of module maintainers um, that drive each module of the open, of the open XLA project. Um, and um, all kind of uh, being stewarded by a set of core maintainers who drive the overall project direction. Um, within the core maintainers, there uh, will uh, could be a lead core maintainer who's basically a catch-all decision maker, but really um, their primary responsibility, and I can talk about this um, later, is to drive consensus among that group of core maintainers, um, not to to kind of hand down dictums from on high. Um, and really we see that role as a facilitator role first and foremost. Another important point is that we wanted to make sure technical governance is strictly separated from um, business governance. Uh, membership in the technical governance process is for individual, individuals and not companies and we'll track with that individual's technical contributions. Um, and so, not addressed in the um, in the doc will share, but one of the things that we wanted to kind of think through out the gate is how to get from where we are today, which is basically no real codified um, governance model to, you know, we've implemented um, this governance model, um, you know, modulo any updates that we make throughout the RFC process. Um, and so what we thought would be good would be to have an accountable group, um, like an interim steering group who transparently stewards the creation of all these uh, structures that are laid out, um, as well as uh, basic governance processes um, to basically bootstrap things and get them going. And that would include things like the code of conduct, um, the key uh, processes like RFCs, um, owners, you know, initial set of owners files and stuff like that. Um, and all of that work should be done kind of, you know, with the transparency of, um, of the, the, uh, structures that we, 
um, hope to follow. So um, having a public roadmap, um, giving reports and community meetings, um, having uh, a roadmap um, kind of a GitHub project that tracks the progress against all the items. Um, and that group will also um, look at whether it makes sense to, to create some non-technical project uh, governance areas outside of that technical structure I shared. Um, I think that it would be great if we had some official uh, support um, and opportunities to collaborate around business and marketing, um, community management and documentation as some examples. Um, but importantly, all of the above groups, including the interim steering group, will defer all the technical decisions to core and module maintainers just to make sure, again, that that scope is well-defined. Um, so the timeline that we have here is that uh, today um, we're, we're sharing these slides in the community meeting. Um, we have a governance RFC that we'll be sharing um, in the community repo. Um, and then in January 17th, I think the, the you know, commentary period will probably last until January 13th. Just I know that this is the holidays, so we wanted to give people as much time as possible to, to read through things and um, have a chance to give feedback. Um, and we'll plan on discussing all the comments that came up um, in the community meeting that's already scheduled on January 17th. And at that point, I think we can decide whether or not, you know, this is a good initial model. We're going to accept the RFC and, and you know, uh, create um, the interim steering group to, to actually work towards implementing it. Or if we still have a lot of comments and need to make some major revisions, we'll, we'll um, you know, decide to do that um, and come up with a new proposal. Um, assuming that the RFC moves forward um, on January 31st, the interim steering group would be responsible for publishing a governance roadmap um, and reporting on, on progress towards that um, in the following community meeting. So I have some slides that are hidden here um, that I can unhide that dig into um, some topics like, uh, you know, what is consensus-based decision-making and how does that really work in practice? Um, and also, how do we uh, kind of envision the roles and responsibilities of those core um, community roles, um, including module maintainers and core maintainers? Um, I can totally dive further into them right now, but in the interest of time, um, I think what I'll do is publish these slides, um, including the hidden ones, um, along with the RFC. And then if we need to do, you know, early in July, a kind of breakout um, deep dive um, into governance, or sorry, January, um, ahead of the RFC being closed, I'm happy to set that up. Um, so I need to update these slides with the RFC link when it's published today on GitHub. I have not had a chance to do that yet, but um, that will happen when we put up the um, slides from this meeting, um, as well as the recording. Um, but the idea would be to provide feedback again by January 13th, and you can do this on GitHub or by emailing me directly um, in, in case, you know, you have some uh, concerns or feedbacks that you want to cover offline. So any uh, kind of Q&A that I can answer here um, before we move along. Oh, so I see, oh, no, never mind. That's not a comment on governance. Any questions? Okay, um, I'm going to send this out to um, the wider group as well. I know that we have a smaller subset today. Um, and I think it might make sense to, I think I'm gonna take a, <laughs> <laughs> a unilateral decision to set up um, a deep dive on this um, in the first week of uh, January, just to give people a chance to, to learn more, in addition to reading the doc. All right, um, that's it for me. And now we have an update on OpenXLA and Erie. And Stella, do you want to take this one? <clears throat> uh, yeah, sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, 
actually thought James was going to take this one, but I, I can take it. I can take it. I, I can take it. Uh, that's right. Well, might as well use this opportunity to uh, introduce Stella to those who don't know her. Uh, she's the lead for Erie uh, at Google. Um, and uh, for those who don't know what Erie, Erie is, Erie is an ML compiler um, that's also come out of Google um, and you know, serves similar use cases to XLA, um, but it's also specialized in complementary in many ways. Um, and men, you know, many members of the community um, over the past few months have reached out to us about the differences between XLA and Erie um, and you know, what is uh, Google's view on these two products going forward. Um, so uh, earlier this year, we started to discuss you know, how we could potentially unify these projects. And we're excited to say today that we intend to unify XLA and Erie under the OpenXLA umbrella. Um, uh, as I said, we see these, these products as very complementary with similar goals and, and shared benefits from unification. So we think this is a great match. Um, and we've already had a lot of conversations around governance and comms and project organization and how we're going to kind of unify these two projects. Um, but uh, there's a lot more details to be, to be figured out and we intend to share more of those details in the new year. Um, so, yeah, we kind of wanted to, to uh, give that update, uh, you know, going into the new year um, and, you know, open it up to any questions. And uh, Stella, you know, if there's anything else I've missed, uh, you can add that as well. Yeah, you, you mostly covered it. I've been, I've been working with the, uh, the OpenXLA team for quite a while to, uh, to align governance and, and other, other items. Um, this has been one of the top, um, top requests from um, a lot of our, our community stakeholders is that uh, we we get organized on this and we provide a good a good landing pad for community engagement and um, unifying this made a lot of sense. So um, we're also, as James said, going to have have plenty more to say about this. We just kind of needed to re release the communication lock a little bit in terms of uh, uh, joining these these communities so that we can we can talk about it and then um, and then. You know, share share more thoughts on plans and and, and directions forward. Um, so stay tuned. So, so to be clear, though, like it's it's unifying governance, but also unifying code bases at some point. Is that what we're talking about? Um, I'm I'm tap dancing a little bit because we're a little bit out of order on the communication, but we are talking about unifying in the long term a uh, the the actual platform in in a fashion. But we're it's it, there, it's a fairly long-term exercise that's being planned right now. Okay, cool. That's that's good. That's good to know. Um, good to good to see as well. You know, keep everybody going in the same direction. I think that's a that's a good welcome development for sure. Yeah, it seemed like the first the first step was to was to pull these together from an organizational and, and community structure, and then um, and then you know plan forward instead of having them be two forks in the woods that that you know, couldn't, couldn't really work together. Exactly. And, and I think just to clarify kind of our statement, you know, what we're trying to communicate today is that we really just want to unify these under the same open XLA project umbrella today uh, and, you know, discussions around product convergence and so on and so forth will come later. Um, sure. And that could maybe evolve naturally anyway, right? So if you've got them under the same umbrella, so that makes sense. Right. Awesome, thank you. Um, and yes, a reminder that we can continue to discuss on GitHub. Um, we'll be uh, publishing um, the Fusion uh, or Ilya's presentation from earlier um, as a thread on X uh, OpenXLA discussions um, in case ever anyone wants to add questions there. Um, and again, look out for the governance RFC that I'll share as well on Discord, just to make sure that um, more folks are able to see that. And I believe we also have a few RFCs out in the community right now um, that I'll add to, to a new thread um, and discussions. I don't think we were able to pull them into a slide today. Um, but yeah, I think we have like a new RFC coming out of the Stable HLO project um, and we'd love to get your eyes on that. 
So before we wrap, um, are there any other questions that people might have had? Um, we've had a few responses in the chat so far, but anything around governance, Erie, um, or Ilya's presentation? All right, well, um, before we go, just wanted to wish everyone um, happy holidays for those of you who are on break. Um, I hope it is restful um, and we look forward to continuing to collaborate um, in the new year. So thanks so much for joining today um, and look out for the recording and slides in the community repo.